morning, Preston Wood. So good to see you today. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Praise the name of the Lord. Let's get the blood flowing. because you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You bet. Amen. And upon that public declaration of faith and obedience to Christ's command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Lord of this life, let your glory shine forever. All the earth, all the earth, the name of the Lord. That's not just a song we sing, but hopefully 
It's a truth that is manifested in our lives. God, be exalted in everything. Everything that we put our hands to, God, be exalted in the way we love our spouse. God, be exalted in the way that we serve the least of these. God, be exalted in our praise and our songs. God, be exalted when we bring you our offerings, the treasures that you have put in our hands. God, be exalted in our relationships. Amen? God, be exalted. He is the one worthy of praise. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. If you're our guest joining us right here in Plano, we're so thankful that you're here. We've been praying for you to join us, and we trust that you sense the love of God that's in this place for you. You've picked a great day to join us today with our guest. Uh, you're not going to want to miss a second of this today. God has anointed this man for this time, and uh, Johnny Moore is going to be speaking with us today. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute, but uh, if you're our guest today, there's a guest registration in the Prestonwood today that you received when you came in. Be sure and fill that out and take that to Guest Central right behind us here. And uh, we have a gift for you, one of Dr. Graham's books we'd love to give you. And we're here to come alongside you in your faith journey in any way that we can. Prayer requests, anything there that we can serve you, put that down there and take that to Guest Central. And if you're joining us online around the world, we trust that you sense the presence of God right where you are as you join in worship with us. This is going to be a great day to acknowledge and cry out for the presence of God and look to his word that is life to us. So before we move any further, why don't you greet somebody around you, fist bump them, high five them, welcome them today. We're really glad that you're here.
Our Father everlasting, the your creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. Come on, church, lift it up. I believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name. such great power in confessing our faith. The Bible tells us, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the power of confession. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There is great power when the church of the Lord Jesus comes together confessing him 
as Lord and Savior of our lives. And we look forward to that day, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, when the Bible says, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we confess today, Jesus is Lord. Isn't that right? Matter of fact, let's just say it together. Let's just say it together, Jesus is Lord. Ready? Jesus is Lord. It is the confession of our faith. Go ahead and be seated. And as you're taking a seat, I want to uh, just add to Michael Neal's welcome earlier, wherever you're watching from online, to those that are visiting today, welcome to services at Prestonwood. We have an incredible service planned for you already in the midst of it. The Spirit of God is here. And uh, speaking of confessions of faith, you know, our pastor's in Phoenix this weekend. If you remember Bill Bornstein, who used to be on our staff, he's preaching for Bill out in Phoenix, and in his stead is Johnny Moore. Johnny's no stranger to Preston Wood, and uh, when we talk about confessing our faith, he has recently written a book called The Martyr's Oath, Living for the Jesus That They're Willing to Die For, and he's going to be signing copies of his newest book uh, right after this service, and we'll give you some instruction on that earlier, but Johnny was with us last year uh, speaking concerning his book, Defying ISIS. Johnny uh, is an incredible communicator of God's Word, but he's an advocate for the persecuted church. And you know, we're just convinced as a church that we don't talk about this enough, and we really need to raise awareness on what's going on around the world. And uh, Johnny really is a uh, foremost leader uh, and expert in the persecuted church. Matter of fact, he's getting on a plane this afternoon, traveling to Egypt, and going to be meeting with some church leaders there. And so uh, God's using him in an incredible way. Uh, I first met Johnny when he was the senior vice president at Liberty University. He did that for a number of years before he went out to Los Angeles. He served as the chief of staff for Mark Burnett. He's so well connected and uh, God's really using him. I mean, he's 34 years old. He serves on uh, President Trump's advisory council with our pastor. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about the influence that he has, I don't know if you were paying attention to the news this week, Mike Pence on Wednesday uh, made this statement and we've got it for you on the screen. I just want to read it uh, to you. It says, Christians in the Middle East should not have to rely on multinational national institutions, i.e. the United Nations, just writing them a check and uh, not having any accountability for it. He says, Christians in the Middle East should not have to rely on multinational institutions when America can help them directly. And tonight it's my privilege to announce that President Trump has ordered the State Department to stop funding ineffective relief efforts at the United Nations. And from this day forward, America will provide support directly to persecuted ministries through USAID. Now listen to this next paragraph. We will no longer, it gets better. We will no longer rely on the United Nations alone to assist persecuted Christians and minorities in the wake of genocide and the atrocities of terrorist groups. The United States will work hand in hand with faith-based groups and private organizations to help those who are persecuted for their faith. This is the moment, now is the time, and America will support these people in their hour of need. And uh, great to see. And. Here's, here's the point of me showing you that this morning. That statement doesn't happen. This is not a stretch to say it. This is the truth. Uh, if you see the picture and the video of Mike Pence making this speech, Johnny Moore's in the bottom corner. You see the back of his head because he's the one speaking directly to the Trump administration, specifically about the persecuted church. And so God is using him. Uh, would you just say welcome to Johnny Moore this morning? Thank you, Johnny, for being here. Appreciate you. Really glad that you're here. Now, uh, before he comes, uh, we have giving our generosity talk this morning. Rick Tillman, he and his wife Sally have been members here since 2010. And uh, he's going to share his heart regarding generosity. And then our ushers will come forward and uh, take up the morning offering. Thank you, Jarrett. You know, I wasn't raised in the church. My folks, neither one of them went to church. And so my mother told me when I was a young boy, you can go to any church you want. So I started going to churches for all the wrong reasons. I'd pop into some free VBSs at the Christian church. I'd go to the, I went to the Lutheran church when I was a Boy Scout, uh, in the Boy Scout troops. Uh, then I, when I started noticing girls, I went to the Methodist church because they had the best looking girls and uh, some great dances, I might add. And uh, then I went to the Congregational church so I could, because they had a gymnasium and they had a basketball team that had won the city championship in the church league. So I, I was there, I was all in for that. 
Uh, but, you know, I never received uh, Christ at that point. I, I, I know I must have been exposed to the gospel, but I had no clue about what a personal relationship with Jesus was all about. In college, I remember uh, a, a Campus Crusade for Christ rep came to my dorm, knocked on the door, and I let him in, and uh, he started sharing the four spiritual laws with me. And, and of course, uh, then he invited me to pray with him. And uh, not wanting to be impolite, I bowed my head and prayed the prayer. I wasn't sincere at all. I'm, I'm going, what's this all about? And, uh, and, except, and then when it was over, he didn't let me off the hook. He says, uh, since I was a music major, he said, hey, we're having a big campus crusade for Christ banquet at the end of this week. Why don't you come play your trumpet and, and uh, give a, your Christian testimony? Well, <laughs> that was not good. So I went and uh, I played my trumpet and I gave a fake Christian testimony because I didn't, I didn't, didn't know Christ for beans. And uh, I always believed in God, but I didn't have any idea about a relationship. And so, um, I, as I look back on, that was the beginning of some steps that God took me through, allowed me to go through to finally stop running from Him. And so, at age 26, I finally accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. But at age 21, I married the love of my life, who's sitting right over there, Sally Mayfield. And uh, so, five years later, when, we, uh, when I accepted Christ and we started going to church, um, you know, Sally, uh, Sally and I thought it was really doing a God a favor if we chucked in a few dollars into the offering plate when we went to church. Well, as we got under preaching and got under biblical uh, teaching, it uh, became very aware to us that if you wanted to live the abundant Christian life, you need to do far more, more than that. You need to give Christ everything. You need to give Him 10% right off the top of your time, your talent, and your treasures. So we, uh, the, the verse that really put us under conviction about this was Malachi 3.10. I'm sure most of you have heard it. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That my, that's the local church, the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, that's the verse. That verse there is the only verse in the entire Word of God where God challenges us to put Him to the test. So, Sally and I made that commitment to, to give the first 10% of our time, talents, and treasures from, to God from the rest of our lives. And we've kept that commitment from, from since then, and God has truly poured out blessings upon us so abundant. I mean, the last 47 years since I gave my life to Christ, our marriage has been so blessed. It's been phenomenal. And I could spend a lot of time telling you about all the blessings, but it takes several hours, and I know I don't have much time. So, I'll just give you a couple of examples. When we were in Amarillo, our church was building a new 3,000-seat worship center. Well, we had two boys, and they were both in private Christian schools, and that was really putting a strain on the finances. But God brought us under conviction, and so we, we decided to give 20% of our income for two straight years uh, while our boys were in Christian colleges. And uh, let me tell you, that was, that was a miraculous thing that God did in our lives. And uh, neither us or our boys had to take out any loans. Secondly, we've been retired for seven years now, and uh, we are debt-free. We are living in Frisco, Texas, loving the life, loving Prestonwood, and uh, we are living at the same standard of living when, as we were when I was working full-time. My challenge to you today, my prayer for you, is if you have not discovered that gift of giving, that finding what the abundant life in Christ is all about by putting God to the test, I pray that you'll do that today. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, you are an awesome God, and you are the Father of your children. And like we as fathers here on earth, Father, you expect your children to love you and be obedient to you. And also, like our, as fathers on earth, you only want to give your children good things that will make us happy. But your word teaches us that tithing on our time, talents, and treasures is where that obedience comes in. Lord, we know that you don't need our money, but you desire our obedience, and the tithe is the first key step in that obedience to you. Father, I pray that everyone listening to this testimony today will have a new understanding of this key step toward living the abundant life in Christ. I pray these things in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Sinner 
there was plunged beneath the flood and God saved and since then I walk in forgiveness all of my guilt is erased the chains of the past are broken at last I got saved oh I got saved to be back at, at Preston Wood. Uh, it, it's an amazing, amazing church. I've known it my whole uh, life. I've admired Jack Graham uh, for, for my uh, entire adult life. And, uh, and, and I think we shared a mutual friend and the founder of Liberty University, a mentor of mine. Uh, you know, I flew in from California uh, yesterday afternoon, so it's good to be back in America. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what they, uh, what they, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know what they say about California, right? If you're going to live in a in a communist state, you might as well live in a beautiful one. And you know, I I, uh, I thought it was all exaggerated a little bit. You know, I spent most of my life in Virginia at Liberty University, so I moved from Liberty University to Hollywood. That was quite quite the transition. And, you know, I was like, okay, it's different. It's not that different until the presidential election. And then I went to, like, in that booth. And, you know, this is, we're voting for a senator, you know, for the state of California. We only got two, right? So we got one up for, for, for election. And I was astonished that when I looked at the ballot, there wasn't even a Republican on the ballot for senator. It was just two Democrats. That's all that was on the ballot. And I was like, this is not Kansas anymore, you know? And uh, I'll let you decide whether I voted for one of the Democrats or Donald Duck. Um, <laughs> Just joking. Or maybe not. You don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I have uh, gotten a new habit. Rather than reading uh, Scripture exclusively, I've started listening to it. 
And it's changed the way I think about the Bible. There's just something different about the Bible when you listen to it. I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of what Jesus said in particular, you know, Jesus' words in the Gospels, they were, they were sermons. They were listened to. They weren't written down. They were written down by people that were listening to him. And, and so sometimes I'll, I'll like arrive in a new place. I'm on the road or I'll be driving in my car and I'll just, I'll just start playing the Bible on, on my iPhone and I'll just let it go and go and go. I, sometimes I've listened to two or three books uh, in the New Testament or, or the Old Testament at, at, at one time. And it, it's really, really impacted my life. But one of the ways it's impacted my life is I see how tough Jesus was sometimes in, in particular. I mean, he, he talked in a really kind way. He, he didn't use very complex sentences. You know, Jesus, Jesus wasn't the type of teacher that wanted you to know how smart uh, he was. He was the type of teacher that would just like go to your heart and you realize you just got whopped aside the head. You didn't see it coming. I mean, this is, this is how Jesus was. Uh, let me just give you an example. You know, say you, you've struggled with your temper your entire life, right? I mean, you, you, you know, you're just always on the edge of getting angry and you live in this pressure and you, you finally think you got it under control because you no longer kick the cat, right? You, you just like bury it all inside of you. You know, you got your anger problem under control. And then you start reading the book of Matthew and you read Jesus's words. And Jesus says, whoever is angry at someone in their heart is in danger of judgment. And, and Jesus says, it, it's the same thing as murder when you are angry or hate someone in your heart. You're like, man, you know, Jesus, I finally got this under control, you know? And, and yet, yet he just goes straight to the heart. You know, your whole life, you had a smart mouth, right? When you were a kid, you know, you really, really tested your, your parents' uh, patience. You, you always just said what was on your mind. You're an adult. You still say what's on, on your mind. You know, you just strike back if someone strikes you, and you're working on it. You're working really, really, really hard on it. You're just keeping your mouth shut. And then you read Luke chapter 6, verse 28, where Jesus says, bless those who curse you. Bless them. I mean, Jesus, it's like I'm doing okay now. And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, says bless those who curse. I mean, Jesus is tough on us. And, and, and yet he, he just is he's so simple with it, right? But he's most tough on us when it comes to the issue I want to talk about this morning. Which has become the passion of my life and my focus. And, and it's the persecuted church. It's Christians around the world who by their faith alone could lose their life or their livelihood. And there are millions and millions and millions of them. And the Bible is written largely about them. The New Testament written largely to them. And, and Jesus had some very specific words to say about them. Let, let me read you one of the things Jesus said about persecuted Christians. By the way, Jesus, you could say, was the first persecuted Christian, crucified for what he was preaching, killed for it. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 16. Jesus said, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that he is doing a service to God. They will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this, so that when that time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I mean, imagine the disciples, right, who were just joining the bandwagon with Jesus. Here's Jesus, very popular teacher, thousands of people showing up on the sides of mountains and, you know, to hear him preach. And they're like on the Jesus team, right? They're the, they're, the, they're the protégés of the most popular teacher in the area. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, oh, by the way, they're going to come kill you. And they're like, Jesus, what? You know, kill me? I, I didn't sign up to be killed. I, I signed up to be a part of you, like your team, your dream team, right? And, you know, killed. And, and the words of Jesus written 2,000 years ago, so relevant today, right? I mean, you have, you have jihadists around the world beheading Christians on, on a beach in Libya because, because they think that they're doing a service to God. Jesus warned us. I've written about a lot of these people. Let me, let me read you one of their stories. And th this story touches me a lot because I'm 34 years old myself. A and here's how the story begins. These are his exact words. I'm 33 years old. And I came to Jesus by accident. My friends and I, we took a wrong turn on a road to a town in, in the Middle East. And we went down this road where there were several men armed and surrounding us. They started shooting at us. And they forced our driver to stop. 
Then they took us to a desolate place for three days with our eyes blindfolded. On the third day, they took our blindfolds off. They took us to a place and they put us at the edge of a big hole. And then they started pushing us in the hole and they started shooting at us one by one. At the time, I only knew the name Jesus from a television show I had watched uh, on TV. Standing at the edge of the hole, I knew it was the last moment of my life. And so I started to pray what I had heard on that television show. I just prayed. He didn't even know what he was praying. He said, I prayed, I love you, Jesus. Have mercy on me and forgive me. And he said, the gunman shot the man next to me, and then it became my turn. I kept praying inside. I love you, Jesus. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. And then I, I just kept praying, and one of the men pushed me into the big hole, and the other man began shooting at me a series of bullets. It was a game to them. But in a miraculous way, all the bullets Miss me. And yet their game continued. Corpses of other people fell on me. And then one of the gunmen shouted, someone is still alive. And so they started shooting at me again. And I thought I was dead. The gunmen left to get shovels to bury us, but they never came back. And I laid there in that hole for hours and, and they didn't return. And dark came. When night came, I rose up and I was all covered in the blood of other people. And I went to a river and I washed myself and I walked to the main road with the name of Jesus on my lips every step of the way. When I got home, people around me learned about my new faith in Christ. I became their enemy, and I didn't know why I was their enemy. Even my own father was ready to kill me when he saw me, and so, so he actually hired someone to kill me. And I went to churches for help, but none of them would accept me. They were all afraid. They, they didn't believe I was a Christian, so I had to run away from the churches. And then I went to hiding. And they caught me and they put me in the basement of a court. And I thought it was the end of my life again. I knew there was a great God and that some people were ready to die for him. And so, so I decided I was, I was ready too. And so I, I, I was hung by my hands for three days. I was tortured for 15 days brutally. I was shot by electricity until I fainted and was left lying in a tomb with wounds, with a hole with insects. The guards, they kept asking me to recant my faith and they promised to give me everything I could dream if I just renounced Jesus. But I refused to leave my faith. So they sentenced me to death and they prepared a cross for me and they were going to crucify me the next day. That night though, as I lay on the ground of that cell, I felt some drops of water and they were falling on me and they were coming from an opening in the ceiling. That opening was covered by a network of wires, but the water had rusted the wires. And so I went up and I pushed the wires aside. They just fell away and there was a hole there and I was easily able to climb through the hole. I pushed myself out of the opening and I ran away. Three times Jesus saved me from death. I'm sure it was Jesus who saved me. I should have been dead. I, I should have been dead even if they cut me into a thousand pieces, I will never leave Jesus Christ. I, I wish I could tell you that was an unusual story, that the type of torture that he endured. I, I, I would... would not like to tell you that the, the miracles were unusual because they aren't. The torture and the miraculous running hand in hand. This is the experience of our suffering brothers and sisters around the world in so many places. I, my, my point to you this morning is that the church still suffers at an unprecedented scale in an unprecedented amount of places. When I was here before, I told you what was happening in, in Iraq and Syria. We have now lost 80% of the Christians in Iraq. We lost 50% of the Christians in Syria. In, in a country like Turkey, in a country like Turkey, you know, we, we don't think about Turkey very often, but, you, but did you know we've lost 99% of the Christian presence in Turkey? 
Istanbul was once called Constantinople. Uh, the reason why it was called Constantinople, it was the center of Christianity. If you ever visit there, and I, I hope you're able to one day, it's an amazing city. And in Istanbul is a church called the Hagia Sophia. For a thousand years, it was the most important and largest cathedral in Christian history. And then the Ottoman Empire came and they made it a mosque. And the Ottoman Empire fell at the beginning of the 20th century and they made it a museum. But in 2016, the Directorate of Religious Affairs in Turkey appointed an imam to the Hagia Sophia. At Ramadan this last year, they read Quranic prayers within the Hagia Sophia on television. Do you know Istanbul in the 1950s, the city of Istanbul, over 50% of the population was Christian. Today in Turkey, less than 1% of the whole country is Christian. In Nigeria, in three states in the northeast of Nigeria, we lost 70% of the churches within a few, year, a few, a few years in, in one part of Nigeria. You know, in fact, more Christians were killed in Nigeria in 2015 by Boko Haram than ISIS killed in Syria. You know, Open Doors said that the number of Christian martyrs doubled from 2013 to 2014 to 2015. Every single year, it doubled. There have been more Christian martyrs in the last 100 years than in the previous 19 centuries combined. You, my brother and my sister in Christ, you are living in the first century again. And even amidst all the changes in different parts of the world, countries like China, it's a very different scenario in China than it was 10 or 20 years ago, and yet there still is unbelievable persecution in certain parts of the country. There's one state in China that, this is not a statistic from a Christian organization, the New York Times reported in 2016 that in one state in China, between 1,200 and 1,700 crosses had been removed from churches by, by the civil authorities in this one state in China. They were removing crosses, and it was 2015, in the state in China at the same time ISIS was breaking them off of churches in Syria and carving them out of the tombstones of Christian cemeteries. One, one, one Christian pastor's wife in this area just, just last year the, the government was trying to, to take away their church and they demanded that they, they vacate their church and do you know what ended up happening? They arrived with the bulldozers to destroy the church and the pastor's wife stood in front of the bulldozers and they bulldozed her. You know, in North Korea, which is on the news every single day in the world that we're living in today because of rocket man, right? You know, madman with nuclear weapons. We're actually, we're actually talking about nuclear war. It's crazy. You know, this is from a different era. And yet, you know, this, this guy is, is insane. But did, but did you know that him and his father and his grandfather, they built that dictatorship on the backs and blood of persecuted Christians. North Korea, according to Open Doors, is the number one persecutor of Christians. It's been that way for more than a decade. There are 70,000 Christians in labor camps in North Korea right now. You know, one you know, family in, in North Korea that I heard about not long ago, uh, they, they were quiet Christians, you know, because there's a great ancient, ancient, but there's a, there's a thriving Christian population, you know, in North and in South Korea. But when the, when the, when the country was united in Pyongyang, you know, a hundred years ago, we had a great, great Christian revival in Pyongyang in North Korea. And their families that have persisted in their Christianity and they quietly practice in their houses and they, they, they keep it hidden from the government. But in one particular circumstance, a, a kid was at school for more one of these families and she just let it slip that their families were Christian or they had a cross. I don't, I don't know the whole story. But what I do know is that it, it threw the family on the radar screen and what, what ended up happening is the government went to the house. They arrested the entire family. They threw them all into a labor camp. I mean, the statistics are like totally overwhelming. I mean, it's so shocking. You know, and you don't hear it that often. You don't see it that often. And, and you know, people don't really care about it that much. But, you know, as, as brothers and sisters of Christ to the persecuted church, you know, what if it were your family? I mean, what if it were your family? Like, like Hannah, you know, it's numbers, numbers, numbers. What about a person? What about a name? What about Hannah? Hannah. She's a mom in Nigeria. Her daughter was one of the daughters kidnapped by Boko Haram when the world erupted with a hashtag, bring back our girls. Hannah, we sat down, my team sat down and talked to her. She recalled to us the night 
uh, that, that horrible, horrible night, she, she said to us, these are her exact words, we heard gunshots coming from the direction of our daughter's boarding school. Lord, my daughter. Uh, uh, girls were leaving the school. We met one girl that was leaving the school and, and I asked her, where are the girls? Where are the girls? And she said, I don't know. And I kept crying. Where is my baby? Where is my baby? I called her name Abigail, Abigail. Some of the girls escaped, but, but Abigail, cause she couldn't jump out of, out of the truck and, and, and she couldn't escape. My baby was not yet 16. Uh, sh she's now 18. I hope one day I'll see her again. With God, all things are possible. And then she said, my baby. And her words just trailed off. My baby. What about your baby? What about your daughter? Your child? If you believe the New Testament... It is your daughter, your son, your brother, your sister. They are our family. Paul wrote to Corinth, if one member of the body of Christ suffers, we all suffer, every, every single one of us. These are, these are not people that we have the luxury of not caring about and being busy about our lives with other things to do. Like, like as Christians, as Christians, God calls us to do something. It could be a little something. It could be a simple prayer that's prayed on a regular basis. But we have to do something for these people. Or you, or you just are reading a different Bible, maybe. But when you read the New Testament, it is written about persecuted people, or it's written to persecuted people. I am a thousand percent convinced we cannot live the Christian life unless we are being persecuted or helping those who are. It's so much that, that we miss, we miss, aside from the experiences, you know, of sitting down. I sat down with a pastor from the Middle East one time that was visiting my, my home in Southern California. Uh, he had his phone, his Middle Eastern, his phone from his country sitting on the table and a text message popped up and it was a picture of a handgun. It's like, what is that? Oh, it's, uh, this guy, he's, he named the terrorist group. It's like, he, he sends this to me every few days. You know, he's, he's threatening his life. He's, well, eventually he'll probably get me. That's the reality. They're willing to die for a Jesus we're barely willing to live for. But see, the other side of the coin is that, you know, while the church is still suffering, the gospel is still shining and it's shining, shining brilliantly around the world in, 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 in unprecedented brightness. It's not just that there's a, a, an unprecedented darkness. It's that against the palette of such darkness, an itty bitty glimmer of light can be seen a mile away. You know, these people are perseverant and they're powerful and the church is growing. I mean, Paul wrote it 2,000 years ago, but it's true today. Philippians 1, verse 12. I want you, this could be written today in a letter from a pastor from Syria. He, 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 Paul writes, Philippians 1, 12. I want you to know, my brothers, that what has happened to me has really worked to advance the gospel. Because of these chains I'm in, most of the brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're encouraged to speak the word of God even more courageously and fearlessly. See, the enemy has tried to destroy us and we just get stronger because we're, you know, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ transcends all, all, of these, all of these other things. I mean, in all of these places, you know, people's lives are being transformed. The church is serving people. The church didn't leave Syria. They could have left Syria. You know, one, one of the, there are lots of reasons why there, there are fewer Christian immigrants and refugees from, from Iraq and Syria. One of the reasons why is because many of the pastors just chose to stay, to serve people who were dying. We did this 2,000 years ago when the plague hit Rome in AD 150 and AD 275. Everybody left, they all fled, but the Christians stayed in the cities to give dignified burials to those who were dying by the plague because it was our responsibility to serve those who were hurting and were in need. And we've seen that in our modern time. You know, in, in Syria, they chose to stay, to serve. They serve Christians and Muslims alike. They just serve everybody because God has called them to do it. And they shine so brightly. This is why I help the church in the Middle East because I, this is why I love the decision that, you know, one of the reasons why I love the decision our, our own, you know, the government has made because we give help to the church and the church serves people best and they get all the credit for it and they serve everybody without discrimination. They just love people. That's what the church does. Yeah, I met one Christian family. They, they left Syria to a neighboring country. They wanted to stay in the region to serve. 
And I sat across the table from them and, and I, I heard their story and, and they, were, they were telling me that they had family members who were jihadists in Syria. And they wrote them a letter. And the letter said, we know where you are. We're going to come get you and we're going to crucify you like Jesus. Do you know what they told me? They said, we wrote them back. And I let us said, we're more than willing to die for Jesus. But please don't crucify us. We're not worthy to die the same death he died. Like, do you see the disconnect between so much of our life and their life? And yet we have the same Lord and the same Savior, the same book. It's so, it, like, like, what's missing? You know, Rose, this, this woman in Nigeria, wonderful, wonderful a lady, when, when our, our, our team visited her to document her, her story, you know, she, she was recounting to us the night Boko Haram came in her house and they beheaded her husband and her children in front of her eyes and she's running out of the house, you know, fleeing for her life and they're chasing her with a knife, demanding that she, that she convert on the spot. And she said, every time they demanded that I convert, she said, I looked back at them and I, she's running, running, running and that she would stop long enough to look back and she said, I just yelled the name of Jesus at them. She, and she's not a pastor or a famous Christian leader. She's just a regular, everyday woman. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They suffer every day, and yet they shine so brightly you know, around, around the world. I mean, they just shine so brightly, and yet we have the same Lord and the same faith and the same Bible. Like, there's so many things we're missing because we're not close enough to them. I mean, we saw it in Egypt. You know, we saw it in Egypt recently. You know, e Egypt is a country that has seen a vast, vast escalation in Christian persecution. ISIS uh, declared very, very early on that the Coptic Christians were their favorite prey, and they beheaded 21 of them on a beach in Libya. You all saw saw the news coverage and the video was entitled a message in blood written to the nation of the cross and just in the last last six months we've had multiple terrorist attacks there and you know the Egyptian president's doing a very very good job of trying to protect all these churches he's put security around all of them he's put he's done a, he's done a, a great great thing to try to protect the churches but every once in a while they've slipped through and they slip through on Palm Sunday and dual suicide bombings killed over 50 people. The terrorists were trying to terrorize the Christians. That's what they were trying to do. To terrify them. So they wouldn't come to church. They, ter they were trying to, remember, terrorism, they were trying to terrify them from coming to church. You know what they did on, on the, the weekend? The next day? They filled the churches in Egypt. And one one uh, famous pastor in Cairo, uh, he, he delivered a sermon, and the sermon in, in Arabic uh, was entitled, A Message to Those Who Kill Us That Day. He, a message to those. Let me read you the sermon. Or part of it. Now, what will we say to those who kill us? The first thing we will say is, thank you very, very much. And you won't believe this when we say thank you. You, you. you know why we thank you? Because you gave us the right to die the same death as Jesus. And this is the biggest honor we could possibly have. This is our faith. And, and by the way, thank you also for helping us achieve our goal. You're helping us and you don't even know it. So because there are people we visited in their homes. One, two, three, four times. We visited them over and over and over. We begged these people to come to church and they wouldn't come to church. Yet what you're doing here, you're bringing people to church that never came to church before. Believe me, your terrorism is bringing people to church that never came. You know, there were people who were living in deep, deep sin. But after the bombing at the cathedral, they started saying to themselves, you know, my, my life isn't guaranteed. I, maybe I should take more care about my soul. So, so I want to tell you, thank you. You're helping us. All these visitations we do, you're so much more effective than we are. You're filling up our churches. Oh, and I want to tell you one last thing, and this thing you will not understand. We Christians, we don't have enemies. We don't have enemies. Other people make enmity with us. But Jesus said, 
I want to tell you that if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? But I say to you, love your enemies. You know, the Christian doesn't make enemies because we're commanded by God to love all of his creation. Everyone's made in the image of God. And so I want to tell you a message to you who kill us. We love you because this is the teaching of our God that, that I am to love you no matter what you do to me. And so I just want to say it. And I want to say it clearly. And he looked at the camera. I love you very much. And, and by the way, I'm going to say one last thing to you, he says. We're praying for you. Because the one who told us to love our enemies also told us to bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. And so the command that I've been given by my God who is full of love demands that I make it a duty to pray for you. So I am praying for you. It seems so strange, right? It seems so strange. And yet, when you read the New Testament, it seems so familiar if you read through the lens of persecution. Like, like this is the experience of millions of Christians, millions and millions of Christians, you know, around the world. It just is their experience. And, and you know what it does, you know, by the way. You know, there's a role for government and there's a role for the church. You know, the role of government is to secure our nations. It is the responsibility given by God to government to secure our nations. That's why we have military heroes in this room who fought to give us freedom and fought to give us security and, and you're heroes and that's your God-ordained responsibility. But it's the job of the church to make your job easier. And I gotta tell you, in certain circumstances around the world, we aren't making your job easier because we aren't being the church as the church can be. Because if we were being the church... God would be using us to serve those before they find this path to terror. God would be using us to love those before they find this path to hate. God would be using us to reform the hearts of people. And you would have less security to do around the world, less people to help around the world. The best thing that a lot of us can do to honor our brave warriors of the United States of America is be the church so that they have less problems to solve on every corner of the planet. We work hand in hand. But by the way, you, you know what happened in Egypt? You know, after all this, this, this story I told you, you know, one, one of the uh, security guards at one of these churches, uh, Christian, was a hero. The, the, the terrorist didn't get inside the church. The bomb, the bomb blew up and it killed him. And so one of the major television networks in Egypt decided to have uh, the wife of this Christian martyr on television. And so there she is, and you know, she's doing a live television interview. Her kids are running. He was a father. The kids are running around, I don't know, three or four kids running around the room, all this. And this woman says, uh, still grieving the loss of her husband, she says on national Egyptian television, I have chosen because of Jesus to forgive those who killed my husband. And the broadcaster breaks down on television. He becomes emotional on television. He breaks his composure. He's crying on television. And he says this. He says, Egyptian Christians are made of steel. They live in this world, but they're not from here. The power of a testimony is so much more powerful than any sermon. Jesus told us this. The word says it, Revelation 12, 11, They defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not live their lives so much that they were afraid to die. You know, we got to help these people. We do. We do. I, I spent so much of my life as an advocate for them. I, you know, in the, in the heart of ISIS, I, I worked to get genocide resolutions passed all around the world. We got them unanimously passed in this country in a divided and partisan political time. I'm working on a bill right now in the Senate that will hold ISIS accountable and that will provide, you know, additional relief to these people. I mean, we, we got to do advocacy. And as a church, we got to pray. And we got to pray like we hope someone would pray for us if it was us. Not, not that little, like, you know, God, please help the persecuted church today. No, like, if that was my son, my daughter, my my family member, then how would I pray? And then stop and think about that. Then pray your prayer. And we got to give. We got we to generously give the way we hope someone would give to us to help rebuild their lives and secure their lives. We got to do all of those things. But you know what I've discovered? As hard as I've worked to bless the persecuted church and be an advocate for the persecuted church, I just end up blessed and changed myself. There's so much of my faith I didn't understand until I started having, having this experience. 
We got to redouble our efforts to stand together with them. We got to work so every church, every community, every school, every life of every Christian is protected, supported. You know, every family that lost a loved one that they can move on. We got to do all of that stuff. But as we work to rebuild and to build and to support those communities, we have to open our hearts to God building us too through their testimony. We must learn to forgive our neighbors the way they forgive their executioners. We must pray for our political opponents in this country in the way they pray for those who sold their children as slaves. We must stand boldly against criticism when truth is unpopular in this culture with the same steel wheel and tender heart that they stood and refused to convert under the sentence of death. We gotta learn from them. We, we can't actually work for them unless we let God work on us. And there are lessons that we can only learn in our faith through the testimony of our persecuted brothers and sisters. We got to do what Paul said 2,000 years ago to Corinth. We got to make room in our hearts for these people. That's the exact phrase he used. In fact, I, in fact, I hear Paul echoing through 2,000 years of Christian history, writing to, to us today as he wrote to Corinth back then, from a suffering church to a free church. Paul writes to us today. Let me read his exact words because they're so relevant to us today. Paul writes, you think you already have everything you need. You think you're already rich. He says, let me tell you about our experience. These are Paul's exact words. I hear him saying them to us today. I, I sometimes think that God has put us apostles on display like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade, condemned to die. And Paul writing the letter to us. We've become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools to the world. Why wouldn't you just convert and live? I mean, you can't lose your Baptist, right? You can't lose your salvation. You just convert. You know, you know, our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools. And you, the free church, you claim to be so wise. You know, we're weak and you're powerful. You're honored and we're ridiculed. And even now, we go hungry and we're thirsty and we don't have enough clothes to keep us warm and we've been beaten and we have no home and we work warily with our hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. We're sometimes treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash. And right up to this present moment, we're being treated that way. Paul writes to Corinth. I'm not writing these things to shame you, free church, but to warn you as beloved children. I don't say these things to condemn you. It's all grace. I've said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die for you. I've spoken to you with this frankness because of how much pride I take to in you. Those are Paul's words. You know, our freedom is to serve those who aren't free. Our joy is to give those who haven't joy, joy. Our, our hope here is to give it to people there. Our prayers here are to be prayed with the intensity that we would want them prayed there. Our, our generosity here is to be exercised for those there. Our advocacy here needs to be so loud that they can hear it there. Our humility here needs to be so genuine that they feel it there. And then we can't let up. We can't let up to every child and mother and father, every pastor and priest and church, you know, every, every one of them, till they rise up from the ashes, we, till every cross is raised high in the persecuted places and every light is relit and every heart is raised and every hope is returned. We can't let up. We mustn't let up. We must rebuild. We must press on. The gates of hell cannot and will never prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. It just can't happen. You know, in fact, I hear the words of Paul to us today as he wrote to the church of Corinth. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? You got nothing. You know, we're a resurrected people with a resurrected God. 
Graves are good for something. They're good for resurrections. You know, and imagine if God could do all of this with a dead person, imagine what he can do with a church that's still alive in the persecuted places because it is still alive in those places. They were hard pressed on every side, but they weren't crushed. They were perplexed, but they weren't in despair. They were persecuted, but they were not abandoned. You didn't abandon them here. You supported them at Prestonwood. They were struck down, but they weren't destroyed. You know, it's a church. It's a church that, quote, carries around in its body the death of Jesus so that the resurrection may also be revealed. See, the church is going to be fine. It's going to be just fine. You know, G- Jesus said uh, in, in a theophany, you go to Dallas Seminary, you learn where that is, in John, John 3.15, you know, the serpent will strike your heel, but he will crush your head. I will crush your head. You know, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. Soon the God of peace, as Paul wrote, will crush Satan underneath our feet. The church is going to be fine. But I'm not sure we're going to be fine in the free church unless we get in the business of helping the persecuted church. God bless you.